right. Well, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Mark Akmulovic. Um, I'm the Zoracle Senior Director of Blockchain Product Management, responsible for our blockchain platform. And uh, I also have a pleasure uh, to introduce for this session Mike Vesey, the CEO of IDRAMP, uh, an Oracle partner. And uh, we're going to talk today about identity proofing solution that uh, Oracle and IDRAMP have put together combining the Hyperledger Indie platform with Hyperledger Fabric. Um, we're going to explain why we're actually using two separate distributed ledgers um, and why that uh, makes the solution stronger. Uh, and we'll actually see a live demo as well that uh, Mike will share with us. So um, we'll begin by talking a little bit about what ID proofing is and why it's important. Um, we will discuss a solution architecture that combines Indian fabric into a whole implementation running in uh, Oracle Cloud and a little bit of the implementation details and the user experience uh, in terms of getting through the onboarding and proofing and discuss some of the opportunities uh, and use cases in the real world and have some time for Q&A at the end. Uh, so with that, let me ask uh, Mike to talk a little bit about uh, verifiable credentials and uh, their importance. Perfect. Thanks, Mark. So throughout the presentation and demonstration today, um, we're going to be talking about identity proofing, why it's important, um, and more importantly, how we can use those proven identities to really um, transform existing processes as we know it. As Mark said, we'll get into a technical discussion uh, of an architecture of how we developed this and why, and that's really exciting. Before we really talk about identity proofing, I want to break down and just explain the verifiable credentials um, uh, in a little bit because we'll be seeing that throughout the presentation and demonstration as well. So we are taking those uh, that proven identity and containing those within verifiable credentials to allow for the, uh, the, the assertion of those attributes by individuals themselves, which breaks that centralized um, uh, predictable data store that uh, is attackable. So through verifiable credentials, uh, we're, we're able to really transform these business processes and, um, and protect the, the privacy of data. And, and the really interesting side effect here is we're also making it more secure and easier to use for, for, the, for the end user, which is a rare combination. So why is identity proofing important? Um, go ahead and go to the next slide, Mark, and I'll, I'll set this up a little bit. So, um, so the first and foremost thing that we're gonna talk about today is really the reduction in fraud. By going through a tight identity proofing process, um, we can eliminate bad actors and, and really try to um, uh, strengthen those services. Um, the, the customer experience is one that I just touched on, the identity proofing uh, process when broken out into a verifiable credential and held by a, um, an individual is a, is a repeatable process that they can go through to gain access to different services. And we're going to demonstrate that. It actually provides a much better customer experience by taking out a lot of the complexity of usernames, passwords, uh, different interfaces for different systems. And we're gonna show that in a, in a government example that we, we put together. We'll, we'll show that through a demonstration of how we can affect those multiple services. Um, Complementing that, the, the consistent IDM process, obviously identity, um, identity const or, or consistent identities can be used to really help downstream systems gather information and make better decisions because they're not dealing with, dealing with varying information as it comes in from different identity sources. So that's the last part that, uh, that we'll touch on. And, um, uh, Mark, I think I'll turn it back over to you to go through the identity proofing uh, over All right. Sure. Thanks, Mike. Um, so, uh, you know, as you, as you saw, a, a lot of this focuses on requirements from uh, government agencies. Uh, could be, you know, local or city government, state, uh, could be a federal agency. But equally, we think uh, this translates into some of the enterprise requirements as well. Uh, and so working with uh, you know, a number of customers like that, uh, certainly see a key requirement that uh, is those agencies or departments, they want to authenticate users against a single set of credentials for multiple applications. Um, they don't want to have the users uh, coming in and setting up identities for each application separately in its own silo. 
so uh, there needs to be uh, some sort of a, uh, environment where a single set of credentials can be used across multiple applications. Um, the idea is to enable, you know, city or state residents and or members of a particular organization to enroll, submit some kind of a verification documents, right, for proofing that in fact uh, they have a particular residence, or they are a member of a particular organization, uh, online or in a touchless manner. Uh, and then on the back end, there needs to be an administrative interface for tracking and managing the process. Some of those documents can be verified automatically. For example, if one of them has a driver's license, uh, most of the state DMVs have, um, in US at least, have API-based systems that allow for automated verification and uh, other documents could be verified. But if it's uh, some other kind of document, there may be manual verification involved and there needs to be certainly an administrative interface that allows for tracking and managing that. Once the identity is created, there is a KVC profile that's created for the user. And there may be a need to share that or desire to share that with related government organizations or other jurisdictions, nonprofit organizations, etc. And in order to ensure that this is not abused, uh, one of the key requirements is to make the sharing self-sovereign, namely that the users are, are going to be asked to approve somebody accessing that particular profile and they can accept or reject that request. And of course, if they accept the request, uh, then uh, the access is granted, but it's also logged in an immutable audit trail. So uh, the entire process from the documents being submitted, verified, and then the you know uh, access to the credentials and a grant of permission to access those credentials all need to be logged in an immutable ledger. So it's sort of a collection of key requirements around the solutions that we've been working on. Now, uh, if you look at uh, how we've implemented this, uh, there is really requirements here that uh, some of those are best addressed by Hypology India, and others are best addressed by Fabric. And we decided rather than try to kind of fit in everything onto one platform, really the best in class solution would combine the benefits of both platforms. So on the top, you see here two key components of the application. There is credential manager application. This is doing the proofing, the onboarding process. And then there's a user wallet uh, based on ARIS, Hypology ARIS project. Um, so um, they're using Indy to essentially maintain the DIDs, decentralized identities, and the issue identity, status of the credentials. Of course, the keys that provide the cryptographic binding and verifiable claims. But there is also a need to maintain a lot of the subsidiary information. And uh, what often happens within the implementations is that the information about the documents that are used for proofing or status of verification, private data, permission grants, all of that is maintained kind of in a database and that becomes vulnerable. And of course, it's not tamper resistant and so on. So in implementing the solution, we decided to use a more general purpose distributed ledger, Hyperledger Fabric, in order to maintain uh, either documents or records themselves or hashes. In some cases, you don't want the documents actually on blockchain, but the hashes could be on the blockchain to ensure that they can be verified. The status of the verification and then the log of the access permission grants, the users being asked to provide access and the granting it or rejecting it. And then, of course, access records when uh, the credentials are being accessed. So uh, in the ideal solutions and this combination of the two ledgers, a more special purpose Indy and more general purpose fabric provides uh, significant benefits. Now, how we've implemented this in an uh, Oracle cloud infrastructure. So you see here that uh, we have uh, on top uh, some kind of a government portal, maybe for city, state agency. And there's a number of services, such as unemployment services, health and human services, housing, court services, et cetera, that are accessed through the portal. In any case, in, in a, for any of those services, when the user is accessing for the first time, they're going to be asked uh, to set up the credentials through the IDRAM credential application uh, on the right here that does the actual verification and, and distribution. And it's connected to both the <coughs> Fabric network and Indian network. Uh, uh, so once credentials are verified, the uh, central identity is established on Indy, but the documents that are used during the proofing and all of the status are stored on Fabric. And then at the end of the process, the identity is created in Oracle Identity Cloud Service that then enables uh, password-free login 
uh, for a variety of the services using the user wallet, right? So credentials actually sent to the user's wallet um, and then verified users uh, can access the applications uh, through the portal directly with their wallet uh, and you're going to see that in a demo in a minute here uh, being used to provide the QR code essentially that they're going to give them access. From a user perspective, the process is very straightforward. Uh, initially, the user through a mobile app uh, uh, registers for verification, so they submit some data. Uh, this is very flexible. It could be driver's license, could be utility bills, uh, whatever other data might be required. State or city, for example, uh, might then go through the verification. Some of those steps will be automated and others may require manual procedures. Once the documents have been verified, then the credentials are created and two things happen. Credentials are distributed into the wallet and there's also accounts created in the identity management system such as in you know, Oracle Identity Cloud or maybe Federated Directory Services, etc. And then when the users go ahead and want to access and log in to the services, then the authentication basically is done by presenting that QR code and that enables backend authentication through the identity management. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, what the user experience will look like. Now, there's a number of benefits of this solution. Obviously, it can be deployed easily, uh, leveraging existing investments. Uh, most customers have some kind of a directory service, or they could use, you know, the Oracle Identity Cloud. Um, it reduces the exposure of identity systems to public internet, uh, because all the proofing is done separately. Of course, we have the auditability and traceability, you know, immutability of the proofing requests and all of the status information. Uh, users have more control, so there is greater trust in being able to actually share the data because they know that it's under their control. Um, uh, it's easy to add credential verification in any service, pretty much, so it's very extensible, standards-based, using Carpology Indian Fabric and an Aries-based wallet. Um, all of the departments within the entity, city or state, will be consistently using the same proofing practices. Uh, so for different types of accounts, you might require different type of proofing documents that could be you know, flexibly configured as well. Uh, and of course, you could uh, you know do some value add services for some of the related jurisdictions. Uh, you know, here for example, in the Bay Area, there are specific you know city services for each city, but then there are Bay Area wide organizations, uh, entities, agencies where uh, they might want to also use the same identity. So. With that, let me uh, switch it back over to Mike to take us through the demonstration. Perfect. Okay, thanks. Let me take the share. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Go ahead. All right. Okay, you seeing that okay, Mark? Let me make that first. Yeah, it's good. All right. Okay, so this is, uh, as we went through in the illustrations uh, previously, this is a resident services portal. And uh, we, we developed this for a POC, and uh, it's going to demonstrate everything that uh, that Mark just went through architecturally. And we'll we'll pause throughout this uh, this recorded demo to explain how some of these pieces are moving through through the system. So the first thing um, with this resident service, you can imagine, and when I'm sharing a, a mobile device on the right here, that's that has that that wallet up that we talked about, and we're going to show process of onboarding basically into the resident services portal and then we're going to show the um, uh, the ability to um, traverse a couple of these different services using that identity instead of creating a separate uh, uh, identity in each in each silo or each stack so let's get started with this um, and I'll, I'll pause it throughout so we can see the first thing we're going to do is we're going to come in and, and say we want to go to jobs and unemployment and we want to file an unemployment claim. Well, the first thing we need to do is get our resident ID. So in order to do that, we're going to start a new verification request. And that's going to allow me as the resident to, to validate, to upload and validate some existing information. And from that, we're going to create a credential. So as we go through this process, we're going to require a driver's license and maybe a social security number. We're going to uh, upload the information. You can see all of that information is pre-filled, put in the social security number and submit it. Okay, so what happens here? So at this point, all of that information has been recorded. And uh, as Mark indicated, we're, we're pushing that out to a fabric based system, storing that information 
And uh, that information is going to be used then for a verification request. So as the resident, I see now that I have a, a, a pending request that is, uh, that, that is proving out my driver's license and my address, and that is going to now be verified. So someone on the other end of this, on the admin side, is going to make the rules and determine how that verification happens. In this case, we're going to verify the uh, driver's license through an API. As, as mentioned, we'll see that it's, it's pending. If we go in here and look, we're going to see that the driver's license has already been automatically verified through an API call to the DMV. We can still look at the details of that if we'd like and see the information that was submitted. There's all the driver's license information. And now we can go and we can do the same thing with the social security number. Maybe that's a manual verification. So there I just provided the manual verification of that service. And now we have all of our required elements that have been verified and, uh, and, it's, and we're ready now to issue that resident ID or those, those set of credentials to the, um, to the end user. So important thing to note here is the end user is, is, they're not going through this process, right? This is the administrative process. The end user is done. They uploaded their documentation. We're sharing that end user wallet on the right here. And what's going to happen now is we're going to do a couple of things. The first thing we're going to do is push a message down this connection to that user saying that all their information has been verified and we're ready to issue that credential. So we'll send that message. It happens through uh, the uh, ARIES actually is, is what's delivering this. And it's sending that message now and saying um, that, you know, that, that all of the credentials have been verified and you're going to receive some credentials here very shortly. So when we issue that same thing, we're going to use that connection and we're going to deliver a resident ID street address and an identification number, resident ID uh, number, and we're gonna, uh, a driver's license, we verified that as well. So now we have three credentials that have been sent and issued into the, um, into the holders, into the, the, the resident's wallet here. You can see the street address, identification, and driver's license. Now, so we have all that information. Now, here's the really cool thing about what's happening. As we go back to those city services to provide verification into those serv city services, our resident here doesn't really need to understand exactly what information is being asked. They don't have to go and search for that information. The wallet is going to figure out what information is being asked for by the verification process from the resident portal. And, it, and the wallet is automatically going to return the required or requested data with the user's consent um, when, when that happens. So through, so, so what has happened here is we took all of that information that we put into the Fabric system and we generated um, some credentials based on Indy and we, and we pushed those out to the holder. So we're mixing those two technologies here. And now we're gonna go back and look at a verification. <clears throat> and this will take us to uh, like say a jobs and now we're going to go back to the jobs and unemployment that we were trying to get into originally. This time now to log in, we just scan this QR code and you can see here what it's asking for to log into jobs and unemployment. It's asking for first name, last name and a social security number, right? So obviously a highly sensitive uh, site and we're sending a, a social security number. So the wallet is figuring all that out. The end user has to say, yes, I consent. I want to send this information. And when they do, they will be logged in to, uh, to file their unemployment uh, claim. So they can go to the you know, uninsurance uh, division or whatever. If they come back to the resident portal and say they want to access a uh, court service, they can use the same exact process. So they don't have to change their process. They don't have to go look for a different username or a different password. They go through the same exact process. This time, when they scan this QR code, the Health and Human Services Department here is asking for a completely different set of information. They don't require a social security number. They require the ID number and a driver's license number and a date of birth. So again, the end user doesn't have to go and find that information or do anything. It's all been issued to them from the onboarding request. All they have to do is decide if it's okay they send the information, it sends it back to the court services, and they're logged in uh, to, their, uh, to their court services site. So you can see how uh, a little bit of identity proofing on the front end simplifies the process for the user as they move through these different services 
and um, uh, really streamlines the process. At the same time, because we've uh, distributed this the way that we have, there's no centralized identity stack to attack, right? There's no centralized predictable login process. Uh, the, the threat, the threat uh, vector on this is very distributed because every holder is, is containing those individual credentials. So uh, that is it for the demonstration. Mark, let me give you the, uh, the share back here. And let's see, I think I can just stop my share. There you go. You should be able to share back. All right. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. And uh, um, yeah, uh, maybe you can also tell us a little bit about the related use cases right. in addition to identity proofing that you see you know, possible. Certainly. Yeah. So, so uh, using the same uh, structure, if you will, would really simplify um, the cross department federations. You know, if you're looking at ways to get through. Uh, different identity silos, identity stacks. This provides you a common way to traverse those. Passwordless login, obviously, is is the the biggest thing here that probably came through in this demo. Is that there is no password. We're not masking the password. It, there is no password. The password is your identity. So um, that's anywhere that you have those services where you really need a strong identity proofing, and then and a and a you know zero trust is getting kicked around. And I my my impression is this is where zero trust starts. Right. Let's remove those passwords, not mask them. Let's remove them. And uh, and so this this solution, this technology lends itself very well to that fraud reduction. Uh, we talked about a little bit um, building a, a system that is, uh, you know, that, that, that does a better job of proving who we're talking to and better uh, know your customer uh, elements is going to reduce fraud. And then mixing and matching, as I mentioned, the IDP solutions, you really eliminate two factor solutions. Um, you can integrate consent forms, all kinds of stuff on top of this technology using the same uh, platform that we just talked about because you have a strong auditing capability as well as a strong identity uh, data assertion. Um, so, Mark, do you want to share? Well, I guess we just have two uh, slides, really, just kind of an about slide talking about some of the projects mm -hmm. we worked on, and then we'll move to Q and A um, if that uh, if that works for you. Yeah, yeah, go ahead and uh, if you talk so, a little bit about ID Ramp. So, just a little bit about ID Ramp. Um, uh, obviously, we're focused on uh, decentralization of identity, really removing uh, passwords and any kind of a zero trust implementation. We worked with um, American Electric Power, uh, reduced on some third party fraud reduction uh, from projects. PricewaterhouseCoopers is doing a zero trust webcasting uh, solution using verifiable credentials to, uh, to gain access. We actually really excited about a platform similar to hop in here uh, called KikoChat that is, uh, is, using, um, is using passwordless self sovereign identity to log into their platform. So you don't have to register for an account. You just go in and, and use your verified email credential to log in. So it's really cool stuff. Um, we are, we're laser focused in, in um, uh, zero trust solutions and, and really all things that, uh, that are uh, around the um, decentralized uh, identity spectrum. So uh, the solution like we just uh, went through and just demonstrated are things that our platform does uh, very natively. And, and, and so, uh, it's it's an exciting time for identity for sure. Uh, so, Mark, I'll let you uh, I'll let you take over and go a little bit more on uh, ID on uh, Oracle. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so, a little bit about uh, Oracle uh, blockchain platform. Uh, obviously, as uh, you saw here, Hyperledger Fabric piece of the solution is actually uh, leveraging Oracle blockchain platform, which is Fabric based. Um, as a cloud service, also available as enterprise edition on premises. It's pre-assembled uh, it, uh, platforms that can interoperate with other fabric nodes. We have a number of deployments where Oracle fabric nodes are mixed in with uh, IBM or Microsoft, or Azure or others um, in various multi-cloud deployments, as well as with uh, on-premise nodes as well. So we provide a lot of flexible topologies, a lot of enterprise grade features. It's really focused on simplifying the whole experience uh, of adopting blockchain from a deployment perspective through ease of integration with a powerful API gateway, uh, is easy to secure with a membership management and fine grained access control, uh, very powerful uh, operational sets of tools and APIs, 
and easy extensibility, as I mentioned, with either Oracle nodes or third-party nodes uh, running Fabric. And in addition, we have released recently a number of uh, new capabilities uh, focusing on the application space, right? Making infrastructure and operations easier uh, is great, but then there are people who are going to also uh, want to understand how to quickly build applications or use existing applications. So we have a number of ISV and SI solutions in our portfolio of partners. And then we've released some development tooling as well, a blockchain application builder that uh, speeds up the custom application development effort. It uh, increases productivity in development and testing, but also can automatically generate chain code from declarative specifications. And so this basically provides a low code environment. And there's in fact a session um, tomorrow morning uh, at, uh, I believe, 1.10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where we're going to be presenting the blockchain app builder and local development platform uh, for Hyperledger Fabric. So uh, you might want to attend that if interested in development and low code. Um, with that, uh, there is a lot of other information that you can access. Uh, we appreciate you participating in this session. On the left-hand side here, you see uh, various links for Oracle blockchain information, uh, our web pages, blogs that are very active, developer site, and a number of videos available on YouTube and uh, Oracle Tube. And on the right-hand side is contact information for DRAMP as well. Um, with that, uh, let's go ahead and uh, take some questions here. Uh, we'll be happy to answer anything that you have. I think we have, uh, well, we have about 10 minutes or so. So um, I'm going through answering some, but is there a way we can promote for, for people to ask questions in person? I'm not sure if that's possible. I'm not sure if it's possible through audio, but uh, I think we probably just have to read them as they submit them through the Q&A. Sure. So a couple of them uh, I responded to already. I'm trying to keep up here. Um, End users need to be online. I posted that in there. Basically, those messages will queue up and be pushed out when the device becomes active again. So um, <coughs> that is part of the uh, Aries communication spec that the mediator will hold those messages and push them out. Uh, hopefully, that answers that question. The credential schema uh, that we showed is, is actually an indie based schema. So that's defined on the Indy network the schema for the credentials that go out. So Fabric doesn't uh, know about that. There's no correlation between those two, which is a good thing, actually. And, um, uh, you know, at any time that, that, that the, the, um, uh, the correlation can be severed by the, uh, by the end user at any time to, to basically, um, you know, change that, uh, uh, basically break that connection back to that uh, issuing authority. Um, let me read a couple more of these. So another question about Aries, the messaging, all the messaging that we saw in there when we did that message out, that push notification message out to the wallet, that's all in Aries communication. Uh, so that's uh, that's handling that messaging uh, protocol as well as the uh, credential delivery. Um, policies have to be trusted. Yeah, so, so David asked a question about uh, verifiable credentials being issued by a trusted uh, issuer. And yeah, that's a great point, David. So what is happening, uh, what, we, what, we, what will happen, right, in the very near future as, as states and governments, uh, and, and this is certainly moving a lot faster in, in Europe uh, than it is here in the U.S., but... Um, the issuance that we're doing here is is an issuance based on a endorsement agreement, basically that we are are putting in place between, say, the DMV in this example of our driver's license, and and our system or a system as the trusted issuer. So we're issuing that driver's license credential on behalf of the state or that trusted institution. Obviously, as states. Uh, and, and regions or countries come out with credentials, then that need goes uh, goes away, right? We can trust those credentials uh, issued by who they should be issued by instead of having to perform that endorsement um, uh, process on behalf of some other organization. And the demonstration here, we showed uh, a couple different ways of doing that, right? So we do have a, a trusted issuer 
in the state um, because we used a DMV API to automatically validate that the information on that uploaded driver's license was valid. And of course, that process is is uh, is getting better all the time. Um, scanning physical documents require a liveness, you know, test, and and all of that is is baked in. Uh, we didn't demonstrate that on this because we're moving really fast, but there is there has to be a way to strongly identify uh, the, the person is who they say they are. We're doing it here by cross-referencing. So we got the driver's license, we have the social security number, mm -hmm. we can do a utility bill, we can do whatever, and we can cross-reference all of that information to make sure that we are um, uh, finding that identity. Mm -hmm. As that evolves, that mm -hmm. will be, there'll be a lot more ways of capturing that information and doing that that identity uh, verification before it's found. And that's a, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a very important piece of the, of the process for sure. And if I can add to that, uh, Mike, as well, uh, yeah. we have recently uh, worked uh, with a bank on a, basically a KYC, e KYC online process for account openings um, uh, in EMEA. So uh, they had specific requirements uh, mandated from kind of central bank authorities and all of that. And uh, they basically combined uh, identity card scan with uh, video capture of signature. So somebody had to write like four times their signature that was captured in a video, facial scan, and then the video call following that where all of that was verified again by somebody from the bank. I mean, it took a few minutes but all of that information was captured and was deemed sufficient by the banking authorities, basically, to allow somebody to open an account. Uh, and of course, you know, now that information is verified through some additional machine learning tools uh, to ensure that the images are matching properly and they're trying to detect false images, you know, if somebody's trying to falsify, you know, something on the documents of the signatures, et cetera. So there is uh, a number of verification means in the back end that can be applied to different documents and you know facial scans, etc. Uh, the framework that we showed here is very flexible, and so it can easily be adopted to leverage whatever additional back end verification might be necessary, depending on where you're creating the identity. Right? If you are, you know, opening a bank account, if you are going to uh, getting a library card, there's all kinds of different requirements. And each organization can decide the level of verification necessary and then plug in those mechanisms. Yeah, as you saw in our demonstration, we intentionally built that very flexible and very open to require multiple different ways of, of or multiple different processes for verification. And as Mark said, it's really up to the business process to determine what level of proofing needs to be done before they before they bind those credentials. And as we showed in the demonstration uh, as well, each uh, organization utilizing those credentials can define that proof request and, and ask for explicit types of information. So if they're asking for a social security number, that's coming from a credential that was much, much more tightly scrutinized on the front end. So the, the, the process will, will naturally make sure that the uh, the holder of those credentials has been through the, the required process to do the binding of their identity, uh, you know, at those different levels. <clears throat> Let's see what other, there's a question here. How do you ensure that the data extracted from the scanned document is reliable? Um, you may not want to share the scanned document entirely, only a subset of the data. Well, again, uh, there is techniques that can be applied depending on the document. Uh, sometimes it involves some uh, machine learning work. In other cases, you actually have the document verified through APIs with the issuer. Um, so the idea then is basically you send information to the issuer and get verification status from them. Yeah, and there's no one, there's not, there's not a single process that's going to check all of those boxes. The key is to be able to incorporate many of those processes um, to, uh, to provide the, the level of assurance needed for the, uh, for the credential that's being issued. All right, uh, please post any other questions if we have missed anything. Um, 
So yeah, there, there's that question about uh, there's a question about uh, passwords. There is no password. There's just the private pr uh, public key. You're correct. Public or the private key is only held on the mobile device in the in the in the uh, credential uh, uh, demonstration that we showed. And if that key is lost, there are ways of recovering. So you can, as an end user, choose to back up, uh, you know, or, or or restore. So there are ways of recovering that. Um, or you simply go through the proofing process again, right? It, that is a, you don't have to go through the whole process, but you can go back to the, you know, the credential manager, the application, if you will, and say, hey, I lost my identity. They can go through a, 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 an abbreviated identity proof and then just reissue through that same type of connection, right? You make the connection, push the credential back down. So it's, it's not, uh, it's, it's actually no different than rebuilding your physical uh, process today. You know, if you lose your driver's license, how do you do it? It's actually easier than that because you don't go through the physical uh, process of going into uh, to, to have it issued again. But but it can be rebuilt that exact uh, same way. Um, lots of questions about yeah personal identities and, and and binding. How do you know who the person is? And I think we answered that uh, that process is getting. Uh, getting better every day, and um, uh, we incorporate multiple, obviously, to, to make sure that we can meet all the business requirements. Um, There's a question here about uh, elaborating on the fabric usage. Uh, in particular, do we create certificate for each user? Just one service account is used uh, to store the flow data. So uh, in these implementations, uh, there is one service account. We don't create a separate uh, certificate enrollment uh, for each uh, user being verified. Um, the service accounts and basically, you know, stores information specific to the users and attribute and then all of the status, uh, all of the other information we talked about that's stored around granting access permissions uh, on request and then whoever's actually accessing the data. Uh, that's all stored, but with the user obviously as an attribute. Uh, there may be situations where it's beneficial to actually have a separate enrollment for each uh, user uh, so that they become actually like a client organization member in the fabric network in some rare cases. Um, but in most cases, that's not required. All right. Uh, so, Mike, I think this one's for you. There is a question about interaction from indie areas to private Ethereum, if that's possible also. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it certainly would be, it certainly would be possible. Um, yeah, there's no correlation between the, there's no dependency on those two networks. They're very separate. So, um, all of the identity uh, credentials and all of the credentials used for service access are, Indie based, all of the data, uh, you know, accumulation data, uh, I guess the identity data that, that provides the backing of those credentials um, is stored in, in fabric in this, so that there's no reason it couldn't be used in another, another system. All right, and then there's a question now about uh, any assurances against men in the middle attack, particularly between the credential manager application and uh, Hyperledger. Well, uh, there is on the on the uh, on the indie ledger side. There's that that endorsement capability I was talking about. So you build, uh, you have your ledger, and and in order to make those transactions or call those transactions, there's a there's a specific endorser uh, uh, agreement that has to be. So there's it's kind of a governance question. Um, if you put it on a uh, on a ledger, that you have to have a specific endorsement capability in order to write to that ledger. So. Um, so there's no way that you could emulate that transaction uh, unless that endorsement private key were compromised. That would be the only way that, that a man in the middle attack could happen there. Um, so that I, I don't think there is a very high likelihood that, that could ever happen. Um, what else do we have? There's another question about documents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, documents stored on chain in fabric, uh, if they're stored and how permissions are managed to allow access to the documents. So uh, that's uh, configurable. In some cases, uh, you might want to store the documents. In other cases, you store documents offline. 
uh, well, you know, somewhere outside of the blockchain, not necessarily offline, but uh, in some kind of a repository, and you provide the hash and URL for those documents in Fabric so that they can be tracked uh, with digital identity and then status information is recorded against the digital identity. Um, you know, as far as the permissions, and you know, if you're talking about the people who are doing the administration on the back end, uh, the application will obviously enroll them as a client user. So uh, those people will have certificates and uh, they only allowed access, uh, assuming that, you know, they are in charge of verifying certain documents. Uh, if they need access, uh, then they can be granted that access uh, to particular documents. But the, the identity is tracked as a client on uh, Fabric Network. Right. The, the really important takeaway from the presentation and the demonstration here is how the, is the mix of technologies to form a really simple to integrate solution, right? For the services, it's very easy to integrate um, and build this, uh, build this dynamic verification system. And we're providing some significant benefit to the end user by making it simpler and easier for them to interact. So the, 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 the you know, what really makes the project special and, and the solution special is that we're not trying to fix everything with a single tool, right? We're using the best, uh, best of class solutions as Mark indicated earlier uh, to really provide the best experience for both the data integrity security, as well as the user friction, the user experience. Um, to make that, you know, to make that solution. All right. All, all right. right. Anything? Missed any questions? I don't think so. No. All right. So uh, I think probably at this point, um, wrapped up all the questions. Let me just share the contact information one last time because uh, somebody was asking. Um, so you can find me on um, LinkedIn. Or uh, you can email me just mark.rakmilovich at oracle.com. First name, that last name at oracle.com will work. And uh, Mike, you want to? Yeah, sure. Actually, info? I've got a, uh, do you want me to share this slide? No, yeah. actually, we have, we have it right here, actually, on this slide. Uh, you share? Oh. I don't see if you're uh, sharing. Okay, I'm, oh, sorry, I was not sharing. Okay, hold on. Let me share. Here we go. So um, there you go. Yeah. Okay. So here's Mike's contact info, and then uh, my contact info is mentioned. You can find me on LinkedIn or um, uh, my first name, that last name, Mark Milovich at Oracle dot com will work as well on email. Yep. And same with me. You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, or find it at our, our website, idramp.com, has a lot of other yeah. uh, podcasts and stuff that we've recorded and, and uh, some demonstrations of kind of different things that we're doing at the platform. So please reach out. We always love talking about uh, this solution in particular because it's using such great technology in an interesting way. So uh, yeah, reach out. All right. So. Um... I think at this point, uh, thanks everybody for attending. Um, the deck itself is available uh, on the schedule app. If you go to the schedule and find the session, you will be able to download the presentation. And uh, we'd love to hear from you if uh, you have any follow up questions. Please shout out to Mike or myself. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.